we're going to continue our series on one word sermons. Tonight the word that we're going to discuss is the word repentance. And we're going to look at it of course from the biblical point of view as we have all through this uh, series. We want to define the word and then look at how it's used and how we are to repent and what that really means. First of all, define. In the Hebrew, the word is a little bit different than what you would suspect. It's the word naham, which means to sigh or breathe deeply, to comfort. That's the way it's translated out of the Hebrew. The Greek is metaneo, to perceive afterwards, to change one's mind or direction. One thing about the word repentance, whether Greek or Hebrew, there's always associated with it a change. Something, someone has got to change. Whether it be an attitude or whether it be direction in their life, something's going to change. And that's kind of built into that word. First thing we want to do is look at the three steps toward repentance. First step, examine yourself. Know yourself. Understand if you do need to repent. In 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, Paul wrote, examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? Test yourself. You know, when we look at that man in the mirror and that man is looking back at us, what does that man tell you? What does that mirror tell you? And I'm not talking about the way you physically look. I'm talking about the way that we spiritually act. First, examine yourself. Second is admit imperfection. One of the things that gets in the way of change is pride. We get so prideful that we don't want to change. We become contented the way we are. We need humility. Matthew 5, verses 3 through 5, Jesus said two things that really captures the humility of the person. First of all, He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in the spirit. Secondly, Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, what is Jesus talking about? He is talking about, first of all, that humble spirit that He calls poor in the Spirit. That if it recognizes a need to change, it will change. And one that mourns over sins. I'm afraid what happens too many times when people obey the gospel that they do not mourn over the sins they've committed. There's no real, real sadness over what they've done in the past. So it's hard to repent on something that you're not sorry of. We see that even oftentimes through the Bible. People who would seek to be repentant or penitent would be sorrowful but yet wouldn't repent. And they sought it with tears. And you know what I'm talking about. Esau. In Esau there was way too much pride. And they kept him from doing what he should have done. Psalm 51 verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit 
a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. A broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. One that is touched by its own sins. You know, when you read Psalm 51, that's David's reaction to Nathan's statement that he is the man. And what Nathan was talking about was a condemnation on David because of what he had done. The sin with Bathsheba, having Uriah killed. And he used a parable to define the actions that David had taken. As a result, when the full brunt force of his sins hit his heart, he wrote Psalm 51. He says against you and you only have I sinned. And then he says this passage that it's a broken and a contrite heart that you desire. That's the penitence that he's looking for. Number one, examine yourself. Number two, admit the imperfections. Number three, accept accountability. Accept your responsibility. In Genesis 3 verse 12, Eve had partaken of the forbidden fruit and then turned around and gave it to Adam and then Adam partook of it. When God came into the garden, He cried out to, to Adam. Well, finally Adam came out. Adam said he was afraid because he had sinned. God said, who told you you sinned? The next words out of Adam's mouth was not like David, Lord, I've, I've sinned. <laughs> the next word was, that woman you gave me, gave me the fruit. It was that woman. Remember what the woman said? Well, it was the devil. Hey, let's, let's kind of pass the buck on this thing. Let's get it. Let's get the sin off my shoulders. Didn't work with God. It didn't matter that he was tempted by his wife or that she was tempted by Satan. It, that part didn't matter. The end result is they were going to be punished for it. They would be held accountable. And we will also. In verses 3 and 4 of Psalm 51, For I acknowledge my transgressions. Not only did he recognize them, he said, I acknowledge them. You know, I've, I've mentioned this before. One of the most impressive things I've ever seen was at an AA meeting. As I've said before, they used our church building in Princeton and, and they invited me to come to some of their meetings. Some of them were uh, not uh, visitor friendly because of some of the uh, things that they would discuss. But when I could, I would. And I never will forget when I walked in and sat down, everything, everybody was talking, they were talking, a lot of them were talking about how long they've been sober or, or off drugs. And when the meeting started, they all would walk, would uh, uh, pass around and say, my name is Joe Public and I'm an alcoholic. Just that blunt. That's a recognition and an admission of their accountability. That was the foundation that they were getting their rehab. We have got, like they, to turn ourselves over 
to the recognition that we need God's Word to help us with our sins, to overcome those sins, and the necessary of repentance. I acknowledge my sin, and my sins are always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. God is well within His rights to destroy my soul. He is well within His rights. Because you see, I am a sinner. And my sins have separated me from God. Had God not intervened, it would be a done deal. But He did intervene. He sent His Son, John 3.16, to this earth, to this world, because He loved the world and He didn't want to see the world perish. And the end result is hope through Christ and His blood. Though I am accountable, God has given me a way of escape. It's God's desire to save all mankind. 2 Peter 3 verse 9, God is not slack concerning His promises as some men count slackness, but is not willing that any man perish, but that all come to a knowledge of the truth. I kid you not, it is sickening the way some people look at God. They look at God as a foreboding, Hateful God. A God that enjoys the death of His people. In fact, if you look at the, some of the Greek mythology, that's where that comes from. They've tried to transpose some of those very characters of the Greek myths to God. God's not like that at all. Now, is He a just God? Yes, He is. Is He a God of wrath? Well, we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, that He is. That those who do not obey the Gospel and do not know Him, they will receive a fiery punishment. So there's no doubt that God is a just God. But is that what God wants? No. No more than when my children were little and they disobeyed me, no more than I wanted to spank them. But it was a necessary thing because if I was going to keep my word, it had to happen. The repentance of Israel in Jeremiah 3, verses 20 through 23. I love the old prophets, don't y'all? I love the way they would plead with Israel to return to God. Listen to this. Surely as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, God said. O house of Israel, a voice was heard on the desolate heights, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel. For they have perverted their way. They have forgotten the Lord, their God. Forgotten God? Is this the year 2021 we're talking about? Have we forgotten God? Return you backsliding children and I will heal your backslidings. Indeed, we do come to you for you are the Lord our God. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. There's only one place where we're going to find salvation and that's through the Lord. It's not just on the mountaintop. It's in the Lord. Look at Hosea 6 and verse 1. 
Come, let us return to the Lord. Now, you know what repentance is. There it is. Come, let us return to the Lord. You see, Jeremiah says, you have forgotten the Lord. You've forgotten me, God says. And now Hosea says, you return to the Lord. For He has torn, but He will heal us. He has stricken, but He will bind us up. His attitude toward the lost could be seen in the lost sheep. You know, back in the few years ago, whenever I was had a few cows, and I came to, or would go to Star to check on them, I would make sure they all were there. When I fed them, I wanted them all to be there. If they weren't, I went looking for them. It wasn't because I was necessarily in love with my cows. I was just thinking about the money I'd lose if they were to get out there and die. And I could have done something about it. But that's not God. When God leaves those 99 and goes out in a dangerous situation at night to find that one little lost lamb, that's more than money. He was not a hireling. He loved that sheep. And when he found it, he brought it home. I'm sure, as most shepherds would do, he would throw it over his shoulders and carry it himself. You wondering who that farmer could be? You know. It's the Father in heaven. He would go out and search until he found that lost lamb. There's a parable of the prodigal son, as we call him, who after he had gathered all of his inheritance together, went to a far place and squandered it all. And here in a pig pen, the Bible says he comes to himself and realizes that the servants of his dad had more to eat than he did. And that they had a job and clean clothes to wear. And the Bible said that he said, I will arise and I will go. There's the determination. The first step was the humility. And then the determination. And I said to my father, I have sinned. There's the accountability. He stood up, walked out of that pig pen, a lot different young man than went into it. He saw his dad. Now his father had waited and watched. And when he saw his son coming, the Bible says, the father ran to meet him. He'd already rehearsed the speech and so he was about to give it. Lord against you. And now all of a sudden, the dad stopped him. Said, my son that was dead is now alive. The, my son that was lost is now found. Bring out the fatted calf. Bring the purple robe and the signet ring. He was restored back to his place. Why? Because of the Father's love. Now that's the God we serve. That's the God that sent Jesus Christ to this earth to die for us. That's the God that loves us. All right, what is true repentance? It's more than being sorry. I was sorry a lot whenever I was a kid. But you know, a lot of times, every time, that sorrow wasn't enough to keep me from getting a whipping. Now, I don't mean a beating. I'm talking about a whipping, you know, where that takes place. 
And it took me a while to realize that there's got to be more involved than sorrow. That's the way it is with God. There's more involved than just being sorry. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 through 10, he said, Now I rejoice, not that you are made sorry, but your sorrow led repentance. We already talked about Esau, who was sorry, but it didn't change anything because he refused to repent. But your sorrow led to repentance, for you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. So there's, there's two differences here. First of all, there is a godly sorrow. That's the sorrow that makes us change. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But worldly sorrow leads to death. It doesn't bring any changes. I think two examples that really stand out in my mind of these kinds of sorrow is first of all Judas. He was sorry for what he had done, for betraying the Lord. But did he repent? No, he went out and hung himself. He took the coward's way out. So he had the sorrow but it didn't lead to repentance. Then there was Peter who sinned. He denied Jesus three times. The third time, he even used expressions that was foreign to a disciple of Christ. As a result, he heard the rooster crow and he realized what he'd done. What did he do? He prayed diligently for forgiveness. He repented. You know, Jesus told him, as we said this morning, and we'll talk about more next week, that Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. What you bind on earth has already been bound. What you loose on earth has already been loosed. You notice Jesus didn't take those keys away from him. Even in his sin, because he repented, Jesus still handed him the keys of the kingdom. And in that great moment in Acts 2, he stood with eleven and proudly proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Instrumental in 3,000 souls to be saved. Folks, we don't serve a God that gives up on us. The problem is we give up on God. He didn't give up. And if you watch his life from that time forward, oh, would he make a mistake? Sure. Because he's human. And as I look across this audience this night, I see a lot of humans. So we make mistakes. We're going to sin. You know, we talked about this morning that, that the number for humanity was six, which is a fall, to, a fall from perfection. That's who we are. That's what we are. But God still loved us enough to give us a plan to be saved and showed us His love. Parable of the Two Sons. Matthew chapter 21. I'm going to read verses 28 through 32. If you have your Bibles, you might want to follow along with me. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first one and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, Assuredly I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Wow. I bet that stung a little bit, didn't it? 
For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. So you, you rejected John and these people that you would throw rocks at, that you would ridicule, the harlots, the publicans. They heard John and they believed him. Surely they're going to be saved before you are. Or saved when you're not. They will be a part of the kingdom that you can't be a part of. You look at those two sons, and maybe we've all been there. We are one of those sons. The father says, go out to the vineyard and work. One obstinate young man said, no, I will not. Notice he didn't even say, sir. No, I will not. He goes to the other one. Yes, sir, I will go. But in the end, which one went? The one that had regretted his previous attitude and said he wouldn't go, he's the one that went. The one that said, yes, sir, I'll go. He didn't go. And like Jesus asked, okay, which one is going to be more acceptable in the sight of the Father? Well, the one that went, even though he said he wasn't going. True repentance is a change of mind and a change of thinking. True repentance is going, even if you said you wouldn't. In Luke 3, verses 8 through 14, Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones. In other words, what Jesus is saying is there is no special treatment to you just because you're a child of Abraham. And even now the axe is laid upon the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Folks, what is he talking about here? What's the good works? What are the, root, the, the uh, works that we are to be doing? So the question is, if the axe is already laid to the root, for those that are not bearing fruit, then what, what is it they need to be doing? What is it we need to be doing? I mean, it's pretty evident that God expects us to be doing something. When you read through the New Testament, you read through the uh, uh, Gospels, notice how many parables was dedicated to us as servants doing something. Doing. Christianity is a doing religion, not just a listening religion. It is a busy religion. And we will be judged by what we do or what we don't do. Repentance is that change of heart from not doing to doing. Now, notice what he goes on to say. So the people ask him, saying, what shall we do then? Okay, they've got the question. Wait a minute. Okay, we don't want to lose our souls in this matter. What is there that we must do? What's this? He answered and said to them, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. He who has food, let him do likewise. Share. Give people what they need. If you have two, give them one. Take care of some of the needs, the physical needs, 
of those around you. The tax collectors came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? Okay, we see what you told the others, but what is it we must do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Quit extorting the money from these people. That's how they made their money. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. Every one of them was told something different. Every one of them had a job to do. And you notice the jobs were a little different. But they were all going to be held accountable for those jobs. Or the axe was to the root. Restitution. This is something that I don't know, whenever I was first converted, it didn't really mean a whole lot to me. And I don't even know that I understood restitution. If at all possible, there should be restitution. When you look at what Jesus said in Luke 19 to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus had climbed the, the tree just to see Jesus. And Jesus saw him and said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming home with you. And he taught him. At the end of that conversation, Zacchaeus looked at the Lord and he said, I will restore all that I have taken from these people. Just like Jesus told them here in Luke chapter 3. Imagine for a minute what that meant to Zacchaeus. There was his livelihood, maybe his savings, whatever. But in everything, it was restitution for the wrong that he had done. Restitution is an extremely important part of repentance. Ephesians 4.28 you who have stolen, steal no more. But rather work with your hands to give to those who are in need. At least that's Terry's paraphrase. Work with your hands. Quit stealing with them. I had a friend of mine, when he became a Christian, he came by to get me one day. He said, I want you to go with me. I said, he said, I'm going up to the gym. I said, why are you going up to the gym? He said, I got something I want to do and I want you to go with me. All right. Went up to the gym. The coach was there. His coach and the coach that was there at the time. He walked in with a big sack. My buddy did. I was calling Mark because that's his name. He walked in and just right at the feet of the coach dumped, I bet you he had 25 jerseys in that thing. Some of them belonged to, to him, some of them belonged to other people, some of it belonged to other schools. He says, these are the jerseys that I walked out with. My mouth dropped open and his dropped open and I'm talking about the coach. He brought every one of them back. That's a small thing. But yet it depicts exactly what Jesus is saying. Restitution. What do you think that meant to that coach? Oh, they're a bunch of old, smelly, nasty, tore up jerseys. But what do you think that one effort that he put out to return those jerseys meant to the coach? Now, to me, 
it defined what Christianity is all about. Now he can look at a Christian and see what a Christian is and what a Christian does because of restitution. Repentance is commanded. Jesus said in Luke 13 verse 3, repent or perish. There's no way of getting around repentance. Peter preached, Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. Peter also preached, in Acts 3 verse 19, Repent and be converted, for the times of refreshing are at hand. Paul preached, Truly in these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, Acts 17.30. Paul preached to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. Acts 26, verse 20. You see, repentance is as necessary as baptism. You know, you've heard me say before, repentance is getting out of the sin business. Well, I mean, that's right. Actually, it's about half right. Not only is it getting out of the sinning business, it's a change of heart. It's not just a change of direction, it's a change of our thinking. You see, a lot of times that's where the problem comes in because we don't look at repentance as a change in our thinking. And yet, we call ourselves converted, but there's no change. Basically, we stop doing things that we've never done in the first place. <laughs> At least that's where a lot of people do it. Where do we put the emphasis? Do we put it on hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, or baptism. Where's the emphasis? Well, as I look at these, we emphasize all of them, don't we? But there's one on here that I promise you there's no salvation without. Does faith precede repentance or repentance precede faith? Jesus preached in Mark 1.15, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe. Acts 3.19, when Peter preached the second sermon, he said, Repent and be converted. Now, the word belief and the word converted is a syndicate. Remember that word? that we talked about the other day, where a part is used for the whole. Well, believe represents the hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized. You repent and you believe. If you believe, you've got to be baptized. Mark 16, 15, 16. If you repent and be converted, to be converted, you have to go through those steps that we've already looked at. But to do that, you've got to repent. The first thing we've got to do is repent. Now, what do I mean by that? What have I been saying? What does repentance mean? It means to change our thinking. And when we change our thinking, we change our direction. And then, and then when we obey the gospel, we obey the gospel because our thinking is different. Too many people go into the baptismal waters and they haven't changed. The waters wash away sins. Right? Acts 22 verse 16. Arise and be baptized, wash away sins. The waters wash away sins. But what gets us into the water? To make us want to be different. It's repentance. 
Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. I've really never looked at it that way before. But all of a sudden now it makes perfect sense. Because repentance has to do with change. Life changing. We can't go to heaven, nor can we expect to go to heaven, if we are not willing to make these changes. The religious world today is content basically with just a formulary approach to salvation. There are some steps here that you're supposed to do. You do those steps and you're fine. A lot of times those steps aren't even associated with Scripture. Tonight, I want to encourage you to change. I really think, starting from the pulpit back, there's not a one of us that doesn't have something we can change in our life. Not a one of us. Because again, we're human. God doesn't expect us to be perfect. But He does expect us to do the best we can. He does expect us to be active and faithful. When He returns, we will be judged by a loving, merciful, kind Father. But a Father who expects us to live for Him and to serve Him and to change our direction. Tonight, if you need to repent, you know, the thing about repentance, a lot of people think you have to come forward and all that. No, you don't have to come forward. But you do have to repent. If you have issues in your life you know you need to deal with, deal with them. Repent. But if you do need to come forward, if you brought shame before the church, or if you have something you're struggling with and just can't get a handle on it, if we can help you, then the invitation is yours. Or if you need to, to repent and, and, and be baptized for the remission of sins, then the invitation is yours while we stand and sing together. Walk the ages, live for me, live